edition. And the first group that celebrated it were the Fatimids of Egypt. And the Fatimids uh, are a dynasty that are not of Sunni theology. They are uh, an extreme Shi'i dynasty. The Fatimids are the ancestors of, in today's time, the Aga Khanis and the Buhra, the Ismailis. Uh, the Fatimids are the, the ancestors of these groups, the extreme Shia groups. And for a number of years, they ruled over Egypt. The Fatimid dynasty ruled over Egypt. And they instituted over 30, 40 festivals. And of course, there's a reason why rulers have festivals. Why do people have festivals? What does it do? Distracting and economy, people come and buy and sell, popularity of whatever is called the nation state in our times or in their times the ruling family, right? So there's a reason why the ruling class want to have public festivals. There's a, there's a uh, philosophy behind it and the Fatimids had over 30 or 40 public festivals throughout the Every few weeks there was a major event and festival and they celebrated Ghadir Khum, they celebrated 10th of Muharram, these are all Shia festivals. They celebrated the birth of this Imam, the death of that Imam. And of those celebrations, it is said, they celebrated the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu This is the first time in Islamic history that we come across the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet As I said, 517 Hijrah, 517. And the people who are doing it are these Fatimids. And as we said, there's clearly a motive for them to do it. When it was done in Fatimid Egypt, then... 150 years later, some Sunni governors thought this was a good idea and they imported this particular festival. And because it was done in Egypt on the 12th of the Rabi'ul Awwal, they, Egypt at that time was a Fatimid state, they imported it to Mosul, which is outside of, uh, of Baghdad, it's a place in Iraq. The first uh, Sunni governor, he was not a Khalifa, the first Sunni governor who celebrated uh, the Mawlid, celebrated at around 670 or so Hijrah. So for 670 years this was unknown in the Muslim world to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet And this celebration was done once again on the 12th and it became a very luxurious festival. And various governors and rulers would then compete with each other who could have the bigger festival and the grander festival. Free meat and free uh, uh, bread and, and free, you know, uh, gifts were given out and people, so it became a, a, a literally a national festival. And as I said, there are reasons why rulers want to do this, and so they began to compete with one another in order to attract the, the trade, the commerce, just like now. Why do governments want the Olympics to happen in their country? Right? Why do governments want the World Cup to come to their country? There's reasons. There, we need to be a little bit more uh, reading in here. And so the governors wanted these festivals to become the biggest, so each one wants theirs to be bigger and bigger. And of course, it's the birthday of the process, and who's ever going to say anything about that? And so slowly but surely, from 660 AH, it began to spread in, in Sunni lands. Initially, some scholars opposed it. Some scholars you know, said, well, if you do it with these conditions, it's okay. After a while, under public pressure, just the floodgates opened, and it became a very, very common uh, festival. And you all know my opinion on this is that... Uh, the way to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet so if, you really, if you really wanted to celebrate it, is to fast on Mondays. Because that's what he would do. If you really want to celebrate his birthday, then you should fast every Monday. Because when he was asked, why do you fast on Monday? He said, because I was born on a Monday. So to take one day of the year and do events and whatnot, I mean, I'm not going to be harsh here, but let me just say, it's a really easy cop-out to show that you're loving the Prophet so If you do something one day. Real love is to be dedicated throughout the year, right? Real love is to show that love every single day. And not just one day of the year by giving some money and going to a festival. Nonetheless, so because the first time that the Mawlid was celebrated was the 12th of Rabi'ul Awal, what happened? It became the date associated in the minds of the people. Even though, and then we conclude here with this section, move on to the next one. Even though academically speaking, it is actually a very weak date. And the 8th and the 10th and even the 2nd, are more authentic historically and they have evidences from the Sahaba and Tabi'un more than the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal. Now, we also know that and there are chains of narrators back to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib who died 95 Hijrah, so there's a gap, he didn't see the Prophet But he said that it has been narrated to me that the Prophet was born at high noon. 
So there's a gap, but it is a gap in early Islam, so we can overlook it. Sayyid ibn Musayyib died 95, his father is of the age of the companions, right? So we, we can overlook this little gap, and this is the only narration that we have about the timing of his birth. And that is high noon, when the sun was at its pinnacle and peak. And of course, there is a clear symbolism here that is not lost on anybody, that when the sun is brightest, this is when the Prophet is coming out with his own truth. That is when Allah is revealing, or, or Allah is sending down the Prophet because it is coinciding with the time of the bright sun. Just like the bright sun illuminates everything, so too this Prophet ﷺ will illuminate everything and nothing will remain uh, dark around him. Now, when it comes to the actual birth of the Prophet ﷺ, there are so many legends and so many narrations, not one of which is academically sound, except for one. Except for one. All the rest of them are really legends. And these legends are mentioned, and subhanAllah, what is really amazing, and you know, I have to say this frankly here, that we don't need to invent lies to praise the Prophet ﷺ. We don't need to invent fairy tales. Allah has praised him enough, and the facts are enough. We don't need to, to, to fabricate things. And what is really amazing is that the earliest books you go to has the least information. But as you go on and on in history, then the books get bigger and bigger, and the details get more and more. And you wonder, where did this come from? And I mean, if you want to come to Mouse to even demonstrate to you, Ibn Ishaq is this big. And then I have another book written in the 9th century about the seerah. Wallahi, it is this big. Now Ibn Ishaq is the first book of seerah, right? And he is saying, I want to write everything I come across. And it's this big. And then you have a book written 700 years later, five times the size of Ibn Ishaq. And this book is full of, and it is said to me, and my shaykh said, and this and that. Where is it coming from? Well, it's something that, as we said, a little bit legends and whatnot. So, what some of you might have heard, the Prophet was born, let's say, already circumcised. One, one report says. Another, another says he was born and he fell into sajda. Another said he was born and he lifted his finger to the sky to say the shahada. I mean, well, like, just we don't need to do this, and it makes a mockery of our religion. It makes a mockery of our religion. We don't need to invent these things about the Prophet He is the best human being, and the facts are enough to show us that. And when we resort to these tales. Wallahi, it, it makes our religion not look as dignified as it needs to look, you know. Ibn Ishaq mentions none of these things, none of these things. Because he doesn't have this information. But when you turn to books written in 700 Hijrah, 800 Hijrah, MashaAllah, the guy knows so many details, you wonder, where did he get it from, okay? There's only one hadith that mentions the birth of the Prophet. He mentions his own birth. And it is a hadith narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad's book of hadith, and it is an authentic hadith. That the Prophet ﷺ said, when my mother gave birth to me. Aha, so now he's telling us. It's a hadith that goes back to him. It's not some... Per because again, imagine who witnessed Amina in the room. Come on. You know, use the brain that Allah has given us. Would a man be there and witness Amina being given birth? So that he then narrates that when he came out, he fell into sajda. When he came out, he lifted his finger to the sky. I mean, you think about it. But now the Prophet is saying, so Allah told him this happened. He is saying, when my mother gave birth to me, this happened. Right? So now this is something we don't have to doubt at all. The Prophet is telling us. So he said that when my mother was carrying me, this is the first thing, that when my mother was carrying me, uh, and in one version, وَضَعَتْنِي gave birth to me. So there are both versions are mentioned. But the point is when he was either in the room or when he came out, my mother saw a light emanate from her that cast its light or, or it reached all the way to the city of Busra in the land of Syria. The city of Busra in the land of Syria. Busra is on the on the south, south which is the border of this of what is is what? Near Dara. Near Dara. But these people don't know where Dara is, so that doesn't do us much good. Okay. <laughs> I might but these people don't know where Dara is. It's basically very close to the Arabian border. It's on more on the southern side of the Arabian, of what is, what is now Saudi Arabia, let's say closer to that side. So it's on the southern side of Syria. So the Prophet is saying that my mother saw a light, either in a dream or a physical light, she doesn't mention what, coming from her that came all the way and illuminated the, the palaces or the city of Busra, uh, the palaces of the cities of Busra in Sham, in Syria. Now, what is the significance of this? Scholars have tried to understand why Syria and why 
you know, this light coming from Amr. Of course, the light is him. The light is the Prophet ﷺ. That she's carrying something that will bring light to Busra of Sham. Allah knows best, but there's some things that have been derived here. That Sham or Syria is mentioned because... Now the people of Syria can be happy. Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of Syrians here. Last time I taught this class, there was no Syrians there. So now we have a lot of Syrians here. Syria is a blessed land, according to our religion. Now before you get really happy, do realize that the Islamic Syria is not modern Syria. Islamic Syria includes modern day Jordan and modern day Palestine, uh, a number of different. So Sham is broader than modern day Syria, but you guys are included so you can breathe easily. Alhamdulillah. So you are the core, yes, you are the core, true. So it is true that our religion considers Sham to be a holy land overall. And of course, uh, the, the children of Ishaq, uh, Bani Israel, the Jews, they always considered that region to be holy, and in particular, Palestine region to be holy. To this day, they do that, right? So, we also believe that there is a type of holiness in these lands. And that, and that is why Allah says in the Quran, Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa al ladhi barakna hawlahu. There is barakah around Masjid al Aqsa. This is Sham. Sham, there is barakah over there. And the Prophet predicted that Sham will remain a fortress of Islam. There's always going to be people of Islam in uh, Sham. And amazingly, Sham was the first major country that was conquered, a uh, province that was conquered after the Arabian Peninsula, right? Right after the death of the Prophet, in the time of Umar ibn al Khattab. Sham was conquered. And one of the first cities, maybe even the first city that was outside the Arabian Peninsula is Busra. So there is an indication that the Prophet system is going to challenge status quo. Sham was the right arm of the Byzantine Empire. I mean, Damascus, do you understand? We think of Damascus as an Arab land or an Arab civilization. Before the coming of Islam, Damascus was the right hand of the Byzantine Empire. It was the jewel of, of the Romans. It was where everything happened, commerce and trade and culture and civilization, everything was there. It was impossible for the Arabs to think that one day Damascus would be the core of Arab civilizations. The Umayyad's capital was Damascus. So by showing the light going to the borders of Syria, there is an indication that Islam is going to conquer this land. It will take over. And that's exactly what happened. That the very first land that was conquered was the land of uh, Syria. And we also believe as Muslims that Isa ibn Maryam will come down in Sham. He's not going to come down in Mecca and Medina. He will descend in Sham because it was Sham that was made holy by his ancestors, the children of Ishaq. It was Sham that was made holy. And he will come down in uh, Damish. And that is where he will meet the Mahdi. And that is of course uh, towards